we continue through this exciting book. Now, Paul the Apostle, in chapter 1, showed that the world, Gentile world, was guilty before God. God revealed himself in nature. But man rejected the revelation of God, in fact, made such a foolish error, he began to worship and serve the creature or the creation rather than the creator. And we are surely at that point again today where the worship of Mother Earth, worship of nature rather than the creator. In chapter 2, he shows how that the Jews who were resting in the law making their boast of God, were no better off than the Gentiles who were guilty before God. Because though they boasted in the fact that they had the law, they weren't keeping the law. And if you don't keep the law, then there's no value to the law. They had the ordinances of God. They had that seal of circumcision which would indicate that they were to be a people that would live after the spirit and not after the flesh. A godly heritage, spiritual people. But that the circumcision did not make them spiritual. Being spiritual is something within the heart of a person and it isn't an outward kind of ritual or ordinance. So showing that the law had no value as far as making them righteous, just having the law didn't give them special privileges, showing that circumcision, unless it really followed that in the heart they were living after the Spirit, the ritual itself did nothing would naturally bring up the question that Paul begins with chapter 3. What advantage, what advantage then has the Jew or what profit is there of circumcision? What's the advantage of being a Jew? What's the advantage of being circumcised? Paul's answer is much and in every way. There are advantages. But Paul said chiefly because unto them were committed the oracles of God. They were people of special privilege. God had revealed his word to them. We are people of special privilege in that God has given us his word. Tonight we're here to study the word of God. And that is a tremendous advantage to have the word of God. An advantage if you keep the word of God and live by the word of God. But if you don't keep the word of God, if you don't live by the word, then having the word itself is not an advantage, but in reality, a responsibility. And you have a greater responsibility knowing the will of God than a person who has never known the will of God or the word of God. So, then Paul declares, for what if some did not believe, or what if they didn't keep his word? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? Here is an interesting concept. If I say, but I don't believe that, 
Does that make it then not so? If I say, I don't believe 2 plus 2 equals 4. And you give me two apples and two more apples and I'll count them. I said, but I don't believe it. Does that mean that 2 plus 2 doesn't equal 4 because I don't believe it? Of course not. It only proves that I'm a fool. And so the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. I don't believe in God. Does that mean that God doesn't exist because he doesn't believe in God? Of course not. I don't believe that this is the word of God. Does that mean that this isn't the word of God? Of course not. And so because some do not believe, does that make the faith of God of no effect? Of course not. It doesn't alter the facts at all. What is, is. Facts are facts. Whether you believe them or not does not alter one iota the truth of God's word. So what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? Does that mean that there's no real power then in believing in God. This word God forbid literally is perish the thought or banish the thought. Uh, the word God isn't in there, but it, it's just God forbid. It's, it's used several times through Romans here, but in the Greek it's just banish the thought. I mean, ridiculous. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. God's truth stands, believe it or not, and whether you believe it or not. Let God be true, let the truth of God stand. And if nobody believes it, it's still true. Because it's God's word. That you might be justified, speaking of God here, as it is written, that you might be justified in your sayings, that you might overcome or prevail when you are judged. Now, this is quoted from Psalm 51. When David had been faced with his sin with Bathsheba. And David prayed to God for forgiveness. You remember that prayer, Have mercy upon me, O God. And according to the abundance of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. For against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this great wickedness in thy sight. And here is where it says then, that you might be justified in your sayings, or righteous in your sayings, and you might overcome or prevail when thou art judged. Now, what he is saying here is that God is justified in what he has said. And men oftentimes challenge then, what God has said about heaven, what God has said about hell. What God has said about the judgment of sinners. And many times people challenge the justice or the fairness of God. You hear it all the time. How could a God of love allow a child to be born without an arm? with a physical impairment. Why would a God of love, and, and it's always the challenging by man of the fairness or the justice of God. There are so many factors that we don't take into consideration when we bring up these kinds of issues. It's interesting how that we want to blame God for every calamity. Even hurricanes are called acts of God. 
things that are destructive, we say, well, God did it. And we blame God falsely. We are living in a world that is in rebellion against God. We are living in a world that is suffering as the consequences of those rebellions. Prior to the flood, there were no hurricanes. There were no violent types of tornadoes and things that were destructive. The earth was surrounded and encompassed in a cloud or vapor that shielded out much of the ultraviolet rays. There did, there didn't have, they didn't know what skin cancer was. They lived to be 900 years old. They had a nice environment. But when God saw that the wickedness of man was exceedingly great and his thought and the imaginations of his heart was only evil continually, God brought the judgment of the flood, removed this water protection barrier from the heavens, the great worldwide flood that followed. But with it followed climactic, dramatic climactic changes and with it the sudden shortening of man's lifespan. No longer living to be close to a millennium, a thousand years old. It's interesting when you think of man's history that Noah lived almost one-sixth of the history of mankind. It's almost sort of frightening to realize I've lived over one one-hundredth of the history of mankind. <laughs> but man's, man's historic existence hasn't been that long. And it was, lifespan was dramatically cut off right after the flood. Why? Because this protection, this blanket around the earth was removed. And now we are exposed to more of the ultraviolet rays of the sun and the cosmic radiation getting through to the earth, creating the mutation of our cells, a quicker breakdown, a faster aging process, and man dying at a much younger age than they did prior. But that's result from sin. Now God warned of the consequences of sin. He said, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. Man did it, and then when it happens, he wants to blame God. If you jump off of our offices next door, go up on the roof and try to fly, jump off, I can tell you that if you survive, you're going to be hurting bad. That's just the law of gravity. Now, if you go up and jump off, you can't really blame me because you're hurting so bad. Because I said, if you jump off that, you're going to really hurt. So in all of your pain, you can't say, why did you hurt me? Why did you say that? You see, I'm not to blame because I warned you of what would be the consequences of a particular action. Even so, God is not to be blamed because he knows that certain actions are going to bring certain results in your life, pain, suffering, sorrow. And, and yet we go ahead and we do these things and then we want to blame God for the consequences. Wrong. And so... Man is wrong in judging God. And so he is speaking of that here in verse 4, that you might prevail when you are judged. <laughs> I have a hard time understanding the mindset of a man 
who would challenge God or who would judge God. Who am I to challenge the justice of God or the fairness of God? And yet we find people doing that, but he prevails. Now, here is their argument. But our disobedience, our unrighteousness, has commended the righteousness of God. God did not destroy us. We as a Jew still exist. And our unrighteousness, and look at their history, always turning away from God. And God would bring them into judgment. God led them into captivity. They suffered a lot of Pain. They suffered a lot of sorrow because of their disobedience to God. But they said, it commends the righteousness of God. God didn't destroy us. So you see, they say, well, why aren't they destroyed? Because they are God's people. So our unrighteousness commended the righteousness of God. Therefore, why should God judge us for being unrighteous? Actually, we only prove that he was true. God said that we were going to turn away. God said that we were going to go into captivity. So we've only proved that God's word is true. And thus, because we've proved that the word of God is true, God really shouldn't judge us for our unrighteousness. He's unfair to take vengeance. And again, Paul uses this phrase, perish the thought. Ridiculous. Because how could God then judge the world. But then they say, but if the truth of God has more abounded through my lie unto his glory, then why am I judged as a sinner? I told this whopping lie of how God was with me and God revealed himself and God led me through these difficult circumstances and people were praising God and saying, oh, bless God, isn't that glorious? It's a big lie, big whopper, but oh, it got the people all excited praising God. And so because so many people were blessed, even people got saved. Why should God judge me? You know, actually God ought to pin a badge on me for telling such a great lie that convinced so many people that God was wonderful. Crazy kind of irrational logic that people concoct. Why am I judged as a sinner? And Paul said, and not rather as We've been slanderously reported as some affirm that we have said, let's do evil that good may come. Paul said, whose damnation is just. I've never said anything like that. Now, God's grace and God's love and God's justification is a glorious thing. The redemption through Jesus Christ is wonderful. And it's especially glorious when a person whose life has been so totally destroyed by sin, they're really at the bottom of the barrel. It's glorious to see the grace of God extended to such a person and their lives transformed miraculously. It's wonderful to see God take someone whose life is worthless according to the world's standards and make of them an instrument of his glory. We sort of call them trophies of grace. 
and we look to what God has wrought and we rejoice together. We see so many of our pastors of Calvary chapels who God rescued from the junk heap and God has raised them up and is using them mightily now in ministering the gospel around the world. And we see these men whom the grace of God has just been magnified because they were so low and God has lifted them from the pit, the miry clay, and has established their feet upon the rock. And, and now they're being such a power for God. Does that mean that I should go out and just really destroy my life in sin and take all the drugs I can get hold of and all so that then I can be saved and God's grace might people is oh praise God look what he did for that poor soul. And so people will glorify God because his grace is sort of exalted in that he reached to the depths and picks no 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 you see, but this is the kind of foolish reasoning that sometimes people have. And Paul is saying, let's do evil that good may come. Some are saying that I am saying that. He said, their damnation is just. So the question again, another question. What then? Are we better than they? That is, we Jews better than the Gentiles. No, in no way. For we have before proved that both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. Now the Jew had the advantage of receiving the oracles of God. God gave them his law. And God told them what he would do for them if they kept his law. And God told them what the consequences would be if they broke the law of God. They broke the law of God and God's word was true. And those consequences of which God warned came upon them. So we've proved that God's word is true. But the advantage then is gone. It's only if you keep the word of God that it is an advantage to you. So, the Jews are no better than the Gentiles. Paul said, we've proved both Jew and Gentile that they're all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. For they are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. So Paul begins to make this indictment against both Jew and Gentile. We are all of us guilty before God. There are none of us who are righteous before God. Not one. There's none that understands. There's none who is seeking after God in the natural state. But we've all gone out of the way. And then he begins to describe them. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they've used deceit. And the poison of asp is under their lips. The mouth speaks blasphemous things. Death proceeds, poison. With their tongues they've used deceit. The mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. The feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. The way of peace they've not known. Feet carrying us to mischief. 
to bloody acts. There's no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things soever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all of the world become guilty before God. The law or keeping rules cannot make you righteous. As I was growing up in church as a young fellow, we had pledge cards that we signed each year at summer camp, the final night. We were to carry these pledge cards in our wallet, which I did, in which I pledged to keep my body pure, not to smoke, not to drink. I pledged not to go to dances. I pledge not to use any foul language. And I kept that pledge card in my wallet. And I did my best to keep that pledge. I didn't go to shows. I didn't go to dances. I didn't drink or I didn't smoke. Kept my body pure. But I was looking at that as the basis for my righteousness. And I felt I am righteous because I don't go to shows. And I don't go to dances. And I don't drink. And I don't smoke. And that was the basis of my righteousness. Pray so many hours or a week and read so many chapters of the Bible. And that was the basis of my righteousness. It was a righteousness of rules that I was keeping. But the keeping of rules cannot give you a righteous standing before God. And, and that was my big mistake. I thought that the keeping of these rules gave me a righteous standing before God. Now, not to imply that I was perfect, not by a long shot. There were times when I would get angry. And in a fit of temper, I would swear. And for a week, I would feel horribly guilty. I would pray. I would wait for Sunday night so I could get saved again. <laughs> and I would feel this horrible guilt. And I would renew my vow to God, asking His forgiveness. But the whole while feeling... I really have no right to ask God for anything or expect anything from God because of how I failed. I failed God and thus I have no right to ask God for anything because I was looking for God to bless me on the basis of my righteousness which was predicated upon my not drinking, smoking, this kind of thing rules that I was keeping. Now, Paul is here talking about what the law says. It says to those that are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may become guilty before God. Because you see, if you keep the whole law and you violate in one point, you're guilty of all. It doesn't matter which point you violated, you're guilty. 
Now, though I never did smoke and never did, you know, drink or whatever, yet I did sneak off once in high school and went to a show. So I was guilty of breaking this pledge card that I had in my pocket while I was sitting in the show. And I still remember that miserable night. <laughs> it was in the Broadway theater there in Santa Ana on Broadway. Stars and stripes forever. And the whole while I was sitting there, I was praying my heart out. <laughs> Didn't really see the picture. My eyes were closed. I was praying, Lord, don't come for the church now. <laughs> Wait till Sunday night until I can repent and get saved again. The law cannot make you righteous. All the law can do is point out your guilt. It makes us guilty before God. And that was the purpose and the intention of the law is to show us guilty before God so that we would not be trusting in our own righteousness but we would be casting ourselves upon the mercy of God. As Jesus was saying, the two men that went into the temple to pray, the, the Pharisee, who said, Father, I thank you that I'm not like other men, especially this old publican over here. But I do all of these good things. I pay tithes and so forth, and I do all these wonderful things. Jesus said this poor old publican over here was, wouldn't even lift his head up, but just was beating on his chest and said, Oh, God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. But Jesus said he went home justified. Why? Because he cast himself upon the mercies of God. He wasn't looking at his own righteousness, which with the Pharisee came from his misinterpreting of the law. He had interpreted the law so that he was in his mind fulfilling the law when in reality he had broken the law, but his misinterpretation made him very self-righteous. Now, what the law says, it says to those that are under the law that every mouth should be stopped and that the whole world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. All that the law can do is show you what sin is. But in seeing what sin is, it should then drive me to God for help and forgiveness. The law reveals the fact that I'm a sinner. And when it has done that, it's fulfilled its purpose. And so it is a mistake to think that you can set a bunch of rules and live by those rules and be righteous. Not so. And, and this is the principle of law. It isn't just the Ten Commandments. It's the principle of rules. So many churches have made the mistake of setting up rules for righteousness within the church. And all that develops is self-righteousness, which will not save. But in contrast now, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Jesus Christ. In the next chapter, Paul is going to use as a classic example of righteousness by faith, the man Abraham. What saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. What? His belief in God. 
But what did he believe? Where does it say that? God took Abraham outside and said, look up into the heavens, Abraham. Now you're talking pre-smog days. <laughs> you're talking desert skies. You're talking pre-light pollution days. No light pollution. The strongest lights were candles, little lanterns. You're talking about a man standing out there in the desert, clear, clear, crystal clear desert air, looking up into the heavens and seeing the Milky Way and the myriads of stars. And God said to Abraham, who at this point was still without his promised son, even as the stars up there are innumerable, so shall thy seed be. And Abraham believed God. And his belief was accounted for righteousness. God said, righteous man. Because he believed God. But just a minute. So shall thy seed be. Abraham understood that God was promising that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, would come from Abraham's seed. That he would be a descendant of Abraham. For as Paul writes a commentary on this passage in Galatians 3.16, Paul points out that it was unto his seed singular as of one, not seeds plural, as of many, for that seed is Jesus Christ. So Abraham believed in Jesus Christ. As Paul said here, the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Jesus Christ unto all and upon all those that believe for there is no difference. So this what righteousness apart from the law being witnessed by the law. Thus in the first book of the Bible, one of the books of the law, here is Abraham believing God and his faith being imputed by God for righteousness. His believing that God would send the Messiah, Jesus Christ, through him. So this righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. That is, unto all and upon all of them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. When you talk about sinners, we're all on the same level. We're all guilty. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's almost a redundant statement because basically the, the definition for sin missing the mark is the same idea as coming short. We haven't lived up to the mark. We've come short of the glory of God. Now, some people are better than others, admittedly. They're not nearly as mean and cantankerous. They have a much sweeter nature. They're not always flying off at every little thing. They're not always cursing people and, and just living a miserable life. There are some people who are by nature quite kind, quite uh, considerate. They're wonderful to be around. Some people I'd rather not even be around. And, and so there are people that come closer to the mark. But we have all come short. And to miss the mark is to miss the mark. But I almost hit it. But you missed, man. Well, I came close. Yeah, but you missed. 
It's like if we were going from here to Catalina and halfway across the channel we sprung a leak and the boat went down and we all started swimming towards Catalina. Because I'm so out of shape, I only get a hundred yards from the spot where the boat went down and I go down. <laughs> but you keep stroking away. You're in good shape. You get within a mile of Catalina and you can see Avalon and you can see the boats and the people. But you're just totally exhausted and you go down. Well, you came closer. <laughs> but we both drown. So, you see, the fact that the consequences are the same. We're sinners. And as sinners, we are then under the judgment of God against sin. Oh, but I'm a pretty good sinner. That's your problem. <laughs> We've all sinned. Come short of the glory of God. But being justified freely by his grace. The word grace means undeserved or unmerited favor. It is giving to me something that I do not deserve at all. We have three words that are sort of associated. The one is justice. We're getting that here in the text. And the word justice means getting what you deserve. And there is something in us that sort of loves justice. We sort of delight in it. He got what he has coming. Good. It's getting what you deserve. Mercy. That's not getting what you deserve. When Napoleon was marching through Paris in one of his victory marches, a young girl broke from the crowd and came up crying, Mercy, sire, mercy for my father. He said, Who is your father? And she named him and he said, Your father's a traitor to France. He deserves to die. She said, I didn't say justice, sire. I said mercy. Yes, it deserved to die, but mercy. It's not getting what you deserve. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. I don't deserve the forgiveness of sins. I don't deserve heaven. I deserve hell. And if justice was served, I would go to hell. But God who is merciful, with his great love wherewith he loved us, and the grace of God. Not only is it that I don't go to hell, but I'm going to spend eternity in heaven. That's grace. God's grace. He gives to me that which I could not earn, that which I do not deserve, and yet God gives to me and bestows upon me his love, his goodness, his blessings, and the eternal benefits of the heavenly kingdom. So, justified freely. Now, the word justified, you need to sort of break that up to get the understanding. Just as if I had never sinned. And that is, God how, that is how God treats my sin. It's just as though I had never been guilty. And God has justified me freely through his grace.
through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, through the fact that Jesus paid the price for me. He died in my stead. Whom God, that is Jesus Christ, whom God has set forth, whom Jesus Christ, God has set forth to be the propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that were passed through the forbearance of God. The judgment of God that had been pronounced against sinning man, the sentence that was already given, the soul that sinneth shall die, the wages of sin is death. That sentence that had been declared, righteously declared by God against sinning man. The righteousness of God has been propitiated through the death of Jesus Christ. So through faith in the blood. The blood of Jesus Christ shed speaks of a life that has been poured out. The life of the flesh is in the blood. And so the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ signifies the giving of his life. Now, the sentence of sin is death. Jesus gave his life, shed his blood. The righteousness of God that demanded the judgment on my sin was satisfied through the death of Christ. He is propitiated, or the satisfaction given, through the fact that Jesus did die and thus the sins have meted or they have experienced then their consequences in Jesus Christ. Now, as Isaiah the prophet said, and Paul said these things were testified in the law and the prophets, Isaiah said, all of us like sheep have gone astray. We turned every one of us to our own ways, but God laid on him the iniquities of us all. So he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. God said, for the transgressions of my people, he was smitten. So Jesus Christ, God incarnate, took upon himself my guilt. Now in the Old Testament, when you had sinned, you would bring a sin offering to the priest. You'd bring a goat or a lamb. You would lay your hands on the head of the goat. You would confess your sins. Thus, in a symbolic sense, transferring your sins over onto the goat. And as soon as you did, the priest would slit its throat, catch the blood in a basin, and put it on the altar. And that goat or that lamb died as a substitute for you. The blood was shed instead of your blood. And there was made then this covering for your sin. So Jesus Christ came as my sin offering. And God laid on him all of my sin, all of my guilt, and then he died for me. Thus the righteousness of God is satisfied in that there has been death for sin. But because of the grace of God, I didn't die for my sins, but Jesus died for my sins. So God freely declares me innocent of all the charges because they have been paid for in the death of Jesus Christ. To declare, he said, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him who believes in Jesus. The righteous demands of God have been satisfied, and God can now declare me innocent. He exonerates me. 
because of my faith in Jesus Christ. Where is boasting then? Can I go around and tell you how good I am? Let me, let's just take a few hours and let me just tell you how wonderful a person I am. All I can say is I am a poor, wretched, miserable sinner, but Jesus died for me. He paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. The boasting is eliminated because it is not by my righteousness that I am saved. It's not by my good works. I am saved by my simple faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Clinging to him and his work, God says, exonerated, forgiven. As Paul was writing to the Ephesians, he said, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, and not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship. I'm so glad for that. For when we get to heaven, we're not going to have to sit around and listen to one another brag over all that they did <laughs> to get there. All the sacrifices I made and all of the things I, and all, you know, uh-uh. When we get there, we're all going to be surprised. We just sit there and say, Wow. Isn't Jesus wonderful? He took all of my sin. He took my guilt. He took my trash. He took my junk. And he died for me. And now by my trust in him, God has exonerated me and brought me into his presence that I might be here in the kingdom of God forever. Oh, praise the name of Jesus. And all the glory and praise will be going to Jesus when we are there not bragging and boasting. Where is boasting? It's eliminated. By what law? Of works? Oh, no, no, no. If I were saved by works, then boasting is in. But it's by the law of faith because it is not what I have done, but what I believe that God has accounted me righteous. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law, without rules and regulations. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Oh yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith, do we then make void the law of God through faith? Oh, God forbid or perish the thought. Yea, we establish the law. No, we don't negate the law of God. We establish the law of God. It was the thing that showed us our helplessness. It was the thing that revealed to us that we couldn't do it on our own, that we needed to reach outside of ourselves for the help of Jesus Christ. And it was, the law of, it was the law that drove me to Jesus Christ to cause me to put my trust and faith in him because I realized that I couldn't keep the law. And so I've established the law, its validity in fulfilling the purpose for which God gave it, and that is to reveal what sin is to me so that I might know that I'm guilty and I need God's help. And thus, seeking the help of God, believing in Jesus Christ, I'm justified apart from the works of the law or apart from certain rules that would make me feel, well, I'm righteous because I do this and I do that. I'm righteous because I believe in Jesus Christ. Oh, but aren't you opening the door then for me to do anything? Well, I do anything I want. But what I want is to please him more than anything else. I'm now bound by another law, not of rules and regulations, but the law of love. 
For the love of Christ, Paul said, constrains me. That's the thing that pressures me to live the right life. I love him so much and he loves me so much. I don't want anything to come between us. I want to do those things that please him. I don't want to do those things that would be distasteful or displeasing to him. And so it is the love of Christ that draws me, and I live actually by a much higher standard than I would if I were under rules. Because it's interesting, the human nature being such as it is, if there are rules by which I am regulated and held in check, I'm always going to find a way to bend the rules to push the limits. You know, you kids are always doing that, pushing the limits. How far can I go? And that's the way it is when you're under the law. You're always pushing the limits. But when you're under this bondage of love, oh, man. It's not how close can I live to the world and still be a Christian, but how close can I live to Jesus? Held by the bonds of love. Great place to be. And when you know and discover the grace of God, which we will be discovering more and more as we continue on in Romans, your love for the Lord is just going to increase as you realize what God by grace has wrought for you, has done for you, and what he's planning to do for you, who by simple faith in Jesus Christ have come to trust in him. Father, we thank you for your word and for, oh, this wonderful position that is ours now, justified freely by your grace through our faith in Jesus Christ. And Lord, we pray that you will teach us more and more about the wonderful plan of salvation, the grace of God, the justification, the sanctification, and that glorification. Draw us, Lord, unto yourself and unto that great love. Bring us into a richer appreciation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we stand? I will serve you because I love you. You have given life to me. I was nothing until you found me. You have given life to me. Heartaches, broken people, ruined lives are wide. Died on Calvary, your touch is all I long for. You have given life to me. Tell him, I will serve you because I love you. You have given life. I was nothing until you found me. You have given life to me. Heartaches, broken people, ruined lives are why you died on Calvary. Your touch. All I long for, you have given life to me. You have given life to me. God bless.
bless you.